this is the new quad blade prop for the Tiny Hawk, which allows you to turtle mode, which is the whole intention of the quad blade prop. The performance change is, yeah, you can't really tell a big difference. The, 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 either the tri-blade is, is, is really well designed or the overall balance and just way this thing flies is not really impacted so much by the prop. You don't really get any more grip or anything. And I personally, even though it's supposed to be a faster prop, the quad blade, I personally think it's even a little bit slower maybe. It's really hard to tell, but the flight time is about the same and it lets you turtle, so there's a benefit there. That being said, we are on the cusp of a whole new wave of brushless whoops. So we have something coming from Beta, we have the trash can, the diatone thing that I can never remember the name of because it's some weird name is probably the best deal. I I think I have one coming, I don't know, but I have a bunch of other whoops coming. The, the Yashin trash can looks really, really good. The Beta FPV quad that's coming looks really good. Anyways, this is the next coming of the brushless whoops because apparently the first wave was really popular, so all these companies are making another one. But I would caution you to even consider these things because while they are very fun and you may already have a Tiny Hawk or a Mobula, do you really want another one? It's pretty much going to be the same thing, and that same money can be spent towards an actual 5-inch quad or in another quad. I know it's Tiny Whoop season and it's all indoors stuff, but still, consider, like, do you really want another Whoop? But whatever. We'll see what they are, how they are when they come out. So let's look at a couple of antennas. So I got a... Um, so there's a new company, Orca, Orc, Orca FPV. These guys are making a goggle, thankfully. Thankfully, somebody is making a decent looking goggle. It may actually be on par or better than Fat Sharks, which I'm really super excited about, but they have first made an antenna. So this is an antenna that they've uh, they've sent me and um, they just wanted me to test and see what I thought about it. It's it's a it's a pretty, okay, I mean, it's a, it's a PCB antenna, so it's another PCB antenna, but it's not quite just another PCB antenna. It is pretty finely tuned. So let me show you the antennas that I actually use. My I've gone back and forth between using just patch antennas and um, omnidirectional antennas <clears throat> a couple of times now. And I've once again landed on a single omnidirectional and a single patch. I am using the rapid fire module, but this is the omnidirectional that I use. This is the ORT antenna. And there's probably a couple of reasons why this antenna is particularly good. It's pretty much an air blade antenna. It's got all these little um, lobes on it, which gives it a very even signal continuity so that it actually picks up everything from all over. It has a very long stem, and I think that's probably its biggest benefit. Um, telling antennas apart yourself is really challenging. You can't really tell in flight. What you can tell is sort of how you feel about the video quality. So what I did was I didn't do any exhaustive testing between these antennas, but I did fly with all of them in my usual areas that I know what the signal is like and also tested them behind, you know, dense objects for their penetration and to see how they perform in that respect. So the omnidirectional, this one, this particular omnidirectional is a little bit better than the Foxier Pagoda long stem, which was my previous omnidirectional. But the dilemma with this, um, this antenna is that it's fragile. So when I put it in my bag, I'm always worried about these lobes actually breaking off or bending and then the antenna is not useless, but it's pretty much useless. This antenna, the X-Air, this is an antenna that I think that everybody should have. This is just such a phenomenally good antenna. This one and the X-2, the, the double wide one. This antenna is the first antenna that I tried that was just day and night better than anything else that I used. It is very similar to the IB Crazy antenna, but this version is a little bit more durable. The casing is a little bit harder, and overall, it's just more durable. This antenna is like two and a half years old, two years, I mean, I got it the, the kind of the week it came out, and I've been using it ever since. So how does this antenna stack up against these other PCB antennas? Well, the PCB antennas are obviously not as intricate of a design, and they cannot perform as well as this antenna because it is much, it's a much higher end design. It's a much more expensive design, more difficult to tune. It's a more expensive antenna overall. But these other antennas are some degree of usefulness. So first of all, let's look at the Foxier antenna. This is the Foxier antenna that comes in this little casing. I just cracked it off to see what's inside. This antenna is essentially useless. And I've cracked it off and actually tried to resolder the, the, the elements myself to try and get the improvement. This antenna, is, it just doesn't, I mean, I don't even know what DBI it's claiming, but it's its essentially worse than any Pagoda that I have. It has, it doesn't do, I mean, 
maybe it was just my testing. I don't know, but it's it's pretty much the lowest level of performance for an antenna. I think a whip antenna would be just as good. I'm sorry, Fox here. I don't really. I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but. I, that's just my findings. I, I don't think this antenna is really worth anybody's time. This is the next one, the Menace antenna. This is just, just a teeny bit better <laughs> than the Foxier antenna. And I don't really understand why, because they both have very similar looking elements in the middle. I mean, all these antennas have very similar looking elements in the middle. I don't understand much about antenna stuff, so I, I mean, I definitely haven't looked into these things. But just from basic testing, of these three PCB antennas, the ORC, ORC, Orca, Orc, Orca antenna is definitely better than these two. I, I can I very clearly, very obviously say that. Now, I'm not trying to, like, advertise for them, prop them up, but, you know, they asked me to look into it, and I was pretty impressed because this antenna performs sort of somewhat on the same level as the Xair antenna. It is a lot cheaper, and it is a lot cheaper in lower-end design as well, but it's kind of in the same ballpark. The Xair is absolutely 100% very easy to tell that it's better, but the Orca antenna is not all that bad. But for the price difference, I mean, I know the x is like 30 bucks or something, but it is such a good antenna that it's really worth every every penny you pay for it because it's just, your video signal is just so clear and so crisp. It's just, it's, it really is that good of an antenna. Is it really even worth considering these PCB antennas at all? And then just go for your favorite omnidirectional, which you probably just want to get a long stem something or other, and you know, you're good to go. Leave it at that. So now let's take a look at this thing. So this is the Racer 3. This is, as you may have seen on DRL, uh, this is the pink one, obviously. And I actually like, I really like this model and this color the most, too. It's not just because of Wild Willie, which is an awesome pilot, and I love watching him on the show. He's probably one of the most entertaining pilots on the show to me because he's so, like, active and, like, he has just reactions to things, so it's really fun. But this is the Racer 3. It's not the newest model. The model that's actually on the show now is the Racer 3S, I believe. And I think it's the same performance, but they've just kind of improved everything. And it's... <laughs> so you guys should realize that DRL is not just a media company. Yeah, they are like mostly a media company. They're just making content for channels. But they're a tech company to me because all of the tech that's on the show now is entirely proprietary. They developed all of it. So they started off with Crossfire and various antenna systems, but they now have an entire tech development team and they've created all of the control systems that they use as well as the video systems that they use, obviously. I mean, they're flying through courses that are an absolute nightmare for control and video. Like, it's insane that they can even maintain control and video in this kind of an environment. They obviously have some sort of a 5.8 router of sorts, which Furious FPV has kind of sort of stumbled upon, like daisy chaining two receivers together, but it's definitely not the way DRL is doing it. On top of that, now the most recent one, obviously it's got a lot more lights in it, but it has fully addressable, as far as I know, I don't know all the details, but I know that they have fully addressable quads and they have the ability to control the quads completely in the air, so they can kill one quad they can kill all the quads you know with the push of a button they can swap control they can change the lights they could they could pretty much do anything on any of the quads as they're flying which is just an unbelievable amount of control i mean there aren't that many i can't even think of any fields of anything any sporting or any tech that has that degree of controllability i mean i guess you could do that stuff with a cell phone but you're comparing cell phones, which are arguably the most developed things in our society now. We're freaking supercomputers in our pockets. I mean, I'm recording this on a phone, and it's recording in 4K, and it's incredible. To something that's designed by, like, a handful of people. And the, the PhDs that are actually on their team, they say that the, the stuff that they're doing is actually the most difficult thing that they've ever done. Like, they actually have PhD developers working on this stuff. So, DRL is really... It's really an amazing company. There are, they're not the only ones. There, there are others, but they're really, I'm really impressed with DRL, especially with the way that they've matured. I mean, when they started, they weren't, they weren't that great, and I was just like, eh, whatever. But they've really matured quite a bit, and I really enjoyed this season. I, I can't even believe that I'm saying this, but I enjoyed watching drone racing on ESPN. Okay, so the Racer 3. This is using 26 motors with 6-inch props, 6-inch tri-blade props. They're obviously not going for performance here or control or anything like that. This is spec racing. They don't really care about any of that stuff. However, they haven't... I, 
if I was to design this quad, I would have made some different design choices to make it even easier to build. It is like a single monocarbon design, and it does work great, and they're using a weird, weird, weird size battery. Um, I, I mean, I would have made some other design decisions, but damn, this thing is awesome. I really wish that they would sell these things. This is the one that they sent to a Andy, Doma FPV, and they, when they send these quads out to people, they actually cut all the wires so that you can't fly them, or if you wanted to fly them, you actually have to repair the damn thing. So it's really frustrating, and that's why we've had this for well over a year, and nobody's even touched it. I just found it in, like, a drawer <laughs> at Piroflip, and I'm like, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm going to try and fix this and actually fly, because I want to see what this thing flies like. I've never flown one of these things, so it would be really fun to see. So, yeah, I'm going to be repairing it, and I'll tell you guys about this quad. And, again, I really wish that they would sell this quad. It's so awesome to even have something that's on that show, and it's it's so popularized right now. I mean, it's like almost like modern nostalgia. This is the seven inch Glide Floss. So we're gonna go with the Glide name. And this is the seven inch version that they just sent me one sample of. So hold on. First off, I wanna say that this frame is delayed like two weeks already and it's gonna come, they tell, tell me it's gonna ship from the factory on the 20th, so it should be here before Christmas. It should be here and available before Christmas. I'm going to do another video on it, obviously, and the first batch is really a prototype batch, even though it's it's complete, it comes with everything, and it's totally complete. It is a prototype batch because we do have to get some manufacturing things worked out, and I got really, really upset at the manufacturer because the last sample group of sample parts that they sent me were so awful. I mean, I have relatively high standards, but this is so below standard. I was so upset at them that they got they actually became afraid. So this is the manufacturer that cuts all of our stuff cuts all the floss frames all the hyperlight frames they have a significant amount of work to do there's thousands and thousands of hyperlight frames going through piroflip and being sold so they we give them a lot of work so that's a nice thing because i can do things like get upset at them and say this is absolutely unacceptable you cannot deliver this quality of stuff so they were about to ship the entire glide order and they got afraid, so they went through and checked all the parts again, and they're now recutting a bunch of parts, which I'm not happy about. We are, I want to switch to the new uh, manufacturer. So the the new Floss 3.0 is coming from a different manufacturer, and it's not my design. I wasn't even crazy about the design, but after people have tested it and I've seen them testing it, I actually like the design quite a bit. It doesn't do anything new, but it's just a refinement on everything, and it is really, it is when you feel it and you hold it, it just feels really good in the hands. Really, really good in the hands. Everything just works really nicely. Anyways, let's move on. So this is the seven inch glide floss. And this is the first seven inch like version of this frame that I've gotten. Like it's the first testing of this frame that I've gotten. And uh, there will be six inch, seven inch, and five inch available on launch. And so you can choose. The launch batch is actually pretty small. It's like 500 frames. So you know, if you want it. I'm, I'm trying to get uh, Sergio to open like a pre-order so that people that really want it, they don't miss out. Anyways, this is the seven inch version. It weighs about 135 grams in the gloss finish. So this is the gloss finish that you're seeing here. Um, Sergio doesn't like the gloss. A lot of people don't like the gloss. I really like the gloss a lot. I think it looks really pretty and it's really easy to wipe clean. It doesn't chip and it doesn't, none of that stuff happens. It, it performs just like, a, I mean, I've already flown this thing and it's it's already scratched up. So you can you can see exactly how the scratches work on the gloss frame versus the regular matte frame. However, the final version of this frame will probably be matte carbon or the oil rub matte carbon. So these are the, the same 2208 1800 KV motors that, uh, that have come and sold out already as well. There is another batch coming, so look for that. It should be available before the end of the year. It definitely should be available before the end of the year. I'll make a video about that when there are more available as well. And also the frame will have options for like this antenna mount on the back, which is gonna be really nice. I can talk about the frame forever. Anyways, how did this perform on six inch compared to the five inch version? And this is like now my oldest quad. It's totally beaten up. But first, let's go over props. So the props that's on this quad right now are the Azure 6145 Pro. 6145 Pro. I hate the word Pro when they add it to, to um, products, but whatever. Something very, very special about this prop is the material, and that's more special than anything else about this prop. So Azure makes great props, and they've gone through like two major prop designs and I really appreciate the fact that they don't have 
50 different props that they make. But this material is the second generation of their carbon resin mix material. And it's unbelievable how stiff this prop is. It's not a thin prop. It does have some thickness to it. So it has like some material thickness, but it's amazing how stiff it is compared to the regular version, which is super not stiff compared to the carbon version. So the difference between these two props is pretty darn extreme. Like this prop, the polycarbonate version is fine. It's, it's okay. I mean, I prefer the five inch version. It's, it doesn't have everything about this stiffer prop is better even though it weighs a whole gram like 1.1 grams more than the than the polycarbonate prop it is better in every possible way it's quieter has more grip more throttle authority more accuracy everything about it is better i don't know about durability i didn't really crash it. i don't want to crash it i only have two sets i can't even find this prop for sale if i can i'll put in a link in the description below but i can't even find it for sale it is it is a phenomenal six inch prop. It is just amazing. It is so smooth, it is so controllable, so great. But it also isn't a perfect match for these 2208 motors. And that's what I'm gonna discuss in a minute. But before that, let's discuss a couple more props and some issues with various quads. So this is the Dahl quad blade prop. I went back, after, after flying the S3 prop again, I got excited about props. So I went back and started testing a whole bunch of props again. So this is the Dahl quad blade copy of the HQ copy of the APC or some other company that made the original 5x4 blade. So everybody's copying everybody, but this is the quad blade version and it is super flimsy, but something about quad blades is just intoxicating when you fly them. They have the best control feel in a five inch quad that you will feel. And there's really no tri blade that can begin to compare. The closest prop to this quad blade prop is the HQ 5.1 by 4.1 by 3, which is really an amazing prop. But the quad blade props just feel so, when you fly a quad blade, you're just like, oh yes, I want to keep flying this prop. It's just so controllable, so great. And now they're like 99 cents too. So I really recommend you just pick up a set and try it. You'll like it at first, but then you'll hate it because number one, it's super amp hungry. You got one extra blade to push through the air. And number two, it's slow. It's really slow. Like just super slow like it, it just knocks like 30 percent off the top of your speed and that's really frustrating but the control and the grip and the way it works is amazing it feels like a six inch quad so i'll get to that in a minute just for for giggles i tried this prop this is the gem fan 3d prop that they made um a while back it's 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 pretty stiff it's it's i mean i, I knew it was going to be bad but pretty much any other five inch prop works better in reverse then this prop does forward or reverse. <laughs> so it's just a paddle blade. So yeah, this is this is this is this is probably probably one of the worst props in five inch I've ever felt. Alright, so now let's discuss six inch versus five inch. So six inch props just naturally have more throttle authority. And you may have heard butter quad. People like to call six inch butter quad. But it's something, it's, it's really curious why the six inch or larger blades just have this kind of super smooth feeling and effect. And there's a couple reasons behind it I personally feel. And I'm gonna try to explain what we're all looking for and maybe some weird things that we shouldn't be looking for. So what do we want in a five inch blade? What do we even want our quads to fly like? Well, I personally want my quad to feel absolutely in control. I don't want it to do anything that I don't tell it to do. And I want it to always feel really solid in the air. I don't want it to waver. And if I give it a stick input, it's like wobbling through the air a little bit. I, get, I don't really know how else to explain it. Having that be really, really in control is what, where the software comes in. The software is getting really, really good at that. But there's also a lot of things in the physical world as well. So I want that super good control but I also want it to be super dull, I guess you could say. So I want it to not be so twitchy to my stick inputs. I want it to maintain its track and only do what I want it to do. And a lot of this comes with just knowing your quad, but I pick up some quads and I'm just like, yeah, this flies well. And other quads just, just doesn't fly well. And there's a multitude of reasons why it doesn't fly well. And getting to that, we also want excellent throttle authority. Throttle authority is a funny thing, and that's personally, I think, what people refer to when they say butter quad, which means, I think, good throttle authority. 
On a six inch quad, the disc loading situation, the disc area to quad weight is so much more favorable than a five inch quad that if you add 100 grams, 200 grams more, it still feels really good in the air and it has excellent throttle authority. On a five inch quad, very often we're coming out of a dive or a hard situation and we're just revving the gas trying to see what the quad will do. <laughs> and it's just like guessing and checking and that's just not good. Like I want to give it the gas and I want it to do exactly what I want it to do. And that's typically what six inch quads do. They just do what you want them to do. They also have much better grip, but in acro, grip is kind of another story. We actually play with grip. Sometimes we want grip, sometimes we don't want grip. So that's that's a different story altogether. But now let's talk about motor and prop combination, particularly the sizes. So what's the minimum size recommended for running a five inch prop? Well, maybe that'll be a 22 or four, but let's back up a little bit. Two inch props. We all know, not all, but a lot of people who do micro stuff know that 1104, 1105, these are great sizes for two inch props. If you go into the super duper lightweight range, you can go with an 804, 0804, and it's gonna be fine with a super duper lightweight two inch, two and a half inch prop. But for the most part, 1105 is pretty much the standard for two inch props. When you move up to 2.5 inches, I would personally say that 1108 is much, much, much better. And I've heard, I haven't tried myself, 1304 is even better for a 2.5 inch prop. So hold on, another disclaimer here. This is entirely based on my experience of testing a whole lot of things and talking to a whole lot of people. And the only reason I'm even making this video and discussing this right now is because I've seen support for my theory that I'm gonna discuss in a minute in other people, other people that I trust, other people that are well known in the community that are kind of coming up with this, coming to the same conclusion. <clears throat> so once we go from 2.5 to three inch, the motor size jumps to 1407. I personally think that 1407 is the perfect size for three inch. Some people say 1408 is even better, but I think 1407 is really the right size for three inch. Can you run three inch on 1108? Of course, it flies fine, but a 1407 is gonna give you that robust performance that you really want. It's gonna fly really well on a 1407. But then let's go to four inch. Well, 1407 works great on four inch as well. However, your quad needs to be really light and agile, just light overall. But I personally think that a 6, 1806 is gonna be better on four inch and maybe even a 2204 is going to be better on 4 inch and depending on your quad setup 2205 might even be the best on 4 inch but now let's move up to 5 inch and this is where it starts getting funny so 2204 is where we start well 1806 and 2204 is where we started on 5 inch today the standard is pretty much 2207 how do we get there so Cobra actually made a 2204 that was really a 2205, and that was the most popular 2204, quote unquote, that people just didn't know was a 2205. So then we all realized, oh, hey, this is a 2205, it's not a 2204, let's all move to 2205, that's much better. And then we went to 2206 and we're like, whoa, this is a lot more power, this is better, it's more efficient, it's more powerful, everything is better about this. And then came the 2207, everybody's like, okay, okay, let's forget about 2206, that's like a bastard size in the middle, it's not lightweight and it's not powerful enough, let's go to 2207, and that's going to be amazing, and that is amazing, and so that's kind of where we landed. 2207 is pretty much this balance of motor weight and control of the prop, and prop, I'm going to get to that in a second. So motor weight, motor weight definitely has an impact on the quad's performance. If you have heavy things at the end of an arm, it's obviously going to be more difficult to move that arm. So a lighter, lighter motor will work better with respect to response of just general overall response. So if you have a motor that's overweight and underpowered, this is all comp more complicated than it seems. If you don't have the power to back up the weight of your motor, then it's just not going to perform very well. That being said, higher weight may mean better magnets, thicker magnets, better stator, more dense stator, all these various things. So basically you just need a very well constructed motor to balance everything out. But 2207 is kind of where we're at. And then 2306 came and 23, people were saying 2206 is better. That's another story. I did do a video based on motor width and height and their control performance for various differences. I'll link that in the description below. It's totally up to you, it's per personal preference. But basically, 2207, 2306 is kind of where we've landed right now. Now, I've kind of pushed into 2208 because I don't like 23 width motors because of where their, their power hump is in the throttle range. I prefer the throttle profile of a 2208 or 2207 and now a 2208. And the reason I went to 2208 is because when I was testing things, the 2208 just had better authority over the prop. It had better control. It's 
plain as day to me. When I fly 2207 and 8, I can easily... I don't even fly my 2207s anymore. i got three quads with 2207s on them. They're brand new. They're sitting there. I don't fly them at all. I only fly my one 2208 quad. So what happened? We went from 2204 to 2208. Should we go bigger? Well, maybe. We don't know. But we also have 2308s, 2407s. We have all these various sizes. And based on all this testing, I've kind of come to the conclusion that I personally like the 2208 best. And everything smaller than a 2207 is just not good. It's just not good. I personally wouldn't recommend anything smaller than a 2207 or a 2306 for 5 inch props. Those, everything lesser is a 4 inch prop, but 4 inch is a different category altogether. But now, what about 6 inch, 7 inch, 10 inch, 13 inch, all these other things? And so this is the, this is the theory. Motor size doesn't, it doesn't track with prop size. It's not a linear relationship. When you go up in prop size, the relationship between the motor size and the performance of the motor versus the prop size, it changes tremendously. And even if you have a tri-blade or a quad blade or whatever blade, it doesn't matter, the prop size is more important than the number of blades that you have. So Jordan, maybe better known as Jet, has recently built a 10-inch quad. It's freaking awesome. But he also decided to use 3115 motors. That's a massive motor for a 10 inch twin blade. And let's also look at the DJI Phantom. The newest DJI Phantom actually uses a 2312, I believe, 2312 motor. Now, DJI is probably the biggest drone company in the world, and they have probably done more research in these motors than anything else. And, and absolutely, the Phantom is geared towards efficiency more than anything else. But they're running an almost nine inch prop, like an 8.7 inch prop on a 2312. That's a pretty big size motor. And it's also a relatively large size prop, but how did Jordan get to 3115 for 10 inch when it's only one inch more than the Phantom running 2312s? Well, because he wants to fly his 10 inch quad like a five inch quad. So getting back to the control and what we want our quads to fly like, when you fly a five inch quad and you compare it to a six inch quad, you just can't get close to things with a six inch. You just do not have that tactile, just fine ability to get close to things confidently. You're always kind of on the edge of, oh, this is smooth, but I don't really know where it's gonna get to once I let go or when I come around this turn or how it's gonna, like it's, it's a little bit unpredictable. I personally think maybe, and others are now thinking also, maybe because of the motor prop combination and maybe the motor is, does not have full authority over the prop. So I have felt all these various five inch motor sizes and compared them all and I went to 2208 because I wanted that control. I wanted authority over the prop. On top of that, I put super light props in my 2208s. That's another thing to say altogether about this entire discussion. I hugely prefer a, 22, a, a super lightweight prop on my 2208s. Massive motor, super light prop because it gets even better control. So now when you move to 6 inch, they're naturally heavier props. What's the right motor size for 6 inch? Well, 2208 does work, as you can see me flying here, but like I told you, I don't have the best control. I don't have absolute control of the quad on 2208 with the 6 inch prop. And you can tell that too, when I'm flying the 5 inch, you just, you could just see it in my flying, that if you can see anything in flying, you can very clearly see it. I have a much better handle on my 5 inch quad than I do on my 6 inch. Yes, the 6-inch has much better throttle authority. I can pull out of dives way easier. It's way, like, smoother to fly. But I just can't get close to anything. And I'm always just like, okay, well, this is, I'm just going to waft around because I can't, I can't get close to things. Whereas on the 5-inch, I'm just, like, zipping around like mad. And I'm just like, I have absolute control. I can do anything I want. It's amazing. But I also don't have the speed and the punch and the throttle authority that I want from the 6-inch quad. So how do we get a larger prop to feel like a smaller prop. Well, the physics of this world is weird, and that probably has a whole lot to do with all of this, but we're still kind of testing things. So now that we've done so much testing of five inch, I'm gonna start testing six inch and seven inch. So I'm gonna be trying seven inch props on the 2208 as well. And I personally am sort of thinking now that maybe a 2210 might be the ideal size for six inch and seven inch. Probably seven inch more than six inch. Maybe I don't. I don't really know. Maybe a twenty three ten, twenty three ten, twenty two ten. One of these kinds of sizes, somewhere in the fifteen hundred kV ish, fourteen fifty to fifteen hundred kV for six S. Maybe the right motor combination and size for six inch 
and maybe seven inch to give you that authority that we want. Now that's not a really big scale up, but at a 2310, you're talking about a 39, 38 gram motor. So it's kind of starting to get a little bit hefty. And I have run 2212s on seven inch. And that's where this entire thought started. When I had the 2212s on seven inch, that quad flew like a five inch quad. I had just about the same control. And that's what you get when you have a motor that's appropriately sized for the prop that you're running. You get that control, you get that amazing control. So yeah, that's the whole theory, that's the discussion. So I'm gonna be testing various motor sizes on, on larger props to see if I can get that control back. And I personally think that six inches is a really, really nice size to fly, and I really want to fly more seven inch props, but they're all polycarbonate. You have to run polycarbonate if you don't want the prop to break, if you touch a leaf, so. Uh, it's debatable whether polycarbonate is going to be able to keep up with a six inch prop like the Azura Blade, which is super stiff. That being said, I don't think we have enough six inch prop options. There hasn't been enough development in six inch props, whatever. More things to come. Another thing to know so, here's some actual dental advice. <clears throat> my teeth are actually not that great. When I was younger, even though I have plenty of dentists in my family, when I was younger, I nobody ever t told me to take care of my, like nobody ever inform me of what was going on. I never, I never even flossed until I got to dental school. And that was a, that was a, was a big issue. And I did have a number of fillings when I was younger, but I never really became wiser because now dentistry is very easy and, you know, it's, it's very easy to do and you don't really feel anything and it's just, it's, it goes through and you're just like, okay, well, we're done now and I can eat again and that's all good. When I went to dental school, I really learned about teeth, obviously, and I learned about my own teeth and I realized, wow, I've been really, really bad. And on top of that, my dentistry is also old and is also not that great and I learned a whole bunch more about dentistry. Basically, when you're younger, you don't really pay so much attention to your teeth and maybe even your health. Then when you get older, you don't, you pay for all that. Like you, you pay for all of your neglect when you're younger and your teeth don't regrow. There is no, nothing, nothing out there that will regrow teeth within our lifetime. There's no chance, it's too complicated biology. Yes, you can regenerate some tooth structure with fluoride toothpaste and various other methods, but we're talking about microns. We're not talking about a big old cavity, like a four millimeter circumference orb of cavity hole in your tooth. Like, you can't regrow that. So, I needed a new crown on one of my teeth. It's not a crown, it's actually non light. But this is how we do crowns today. We mill them out of a solid block. And a lot of people will say, why don't you 3D print them? Well, we don't 3D print because 3D printing inherently has issues. It inherently has inconsistencies in the 3D print. You can easily have bubbles and various imperfections in the print. And if you don't have a perfect device or appliance or whatever you're going to put on the tooth or in the mouth, well, that just results in more complications down the line that you're going to have to deal with. So that's not good. So that's why we use the milling process more than anything else. And even crowns that are sent to, that are not created like this or dental work that's not created like this in the office, this is done inside the dental office. If it's sent to a lab or some other organization or entity to make the product that you put in the patient's mouth, it is milled. It's it's almost entire, almost almost always milled from a solid block or something or other, and that's just how it's done today. Pretty interesting. This is actually a three-axis mill. You got two heads going back and forth and doing, cutting the pattern, and there are super 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 fine diamond burrs, super fine diamond bits in there. And it's cutting at like 100 microns. Each layer is like 100 microns or like somewhere in that vicinity. Depends on the machine you're using. And it's being cut in the blue state, which is called the early stage. So <clears throat> this material is a lithium disilicate. There's a bunch of other materials that we use. This material is cut in a relatively softer state so that you don't ruin your machine and you can actually cut it a little bit quicker. And then it's fit in the patient's mouth and it's then stained and glazed while it's in this like purpley looking color, because so it's hard to tell the color. And then you cook it. You cook it in a kiln and it comes out the right color as a tooth. And then you stick it in place. And then the whole process of sticking this to the tooth is actually very complicated as well. I'm not going to get into it. I'm sure people aren't <laughs> really interested in this. Anyways, this, the, the moral of the story is please floss your teeth. I hope this was helpful and I have a lot more that's coming next week. However, I'm going to be in Dallas next week just for work. So I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to have time to see any of you or do anything. But I'm just there for work and then I'm going to be coming back and I have going to have a bunch of things at my door. I know I will because there's a lot of stuff